All right. Hi, welcome to Office Hours. I am Mary Poplin, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about how to make the eyes of Ibad um, Dune Spice Eye. Okay, so if you watched Dune, and I did because I think I read Dune when I was 12. Um, if you've watched Dune, you know that a lot of the characters on Arrakis, uh, which is the desert planet they're on, have these eyes that are blue. And that's an effect that had to be done in post. And we're going to talk about how they did that. And, you know, the solution, as you might guess, it's roto. It's lots and lots and lots of roto. So rotoscoping eyes is always a challenge, especially when there are some sorts of um, occlusions or blurs. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to get around those sorts of obstacles. So I'm going to show you a shot that I've done. I'm going to walk you through what I did, and then I'm going to show you how to do something like that shot that's a little more challenging from scratch. All right, so let's get started. Let's go to R. All right, so here is my shot. What I've done is I've taken this, this lovely video that I got off Pexels, and as y'all will remember, I tend to get video off Pexels, and the reason I do that is because y'all can download them and follow along or do your own effects this way. So pexels.com, there's a lot of wonderful free footage up there, and this is a lovely piece of footage that I got from there. Um, this is a woman um, out in the desert. She's wearing um, a head covering, and um, originally this shot looks like this. And so what we've done is we've taken this shot and we've turned it into this shot. And it'll take a second for it to, there we go. We've turned it into this shot. And what did we do? Well, what we did is we did a lot of roto and then we did some color correction. So I used some reference photos to see if I could get this effect right. And if you watch the old movie, um, some of what they did, well, they overdid it. You know, they they made the eyes just completely uh, tinted blue with um, with no changes to the color and no subtlety at all. Um, what I've done is a couple of step process that tries to keep some of the quality of her eye while changing the color. All right, because we want this to look natural. So let's turn our references off and let's talk about what we did. So the first thing we did is we rotoscoped her eyes and I'm going to show you that. And then, as I said, later on, I'm going to show you how to do this shot from scratch. Well, a shot like this from scratch, that's actually a little more challenging, but we'll talk a little bit about this. Let's launch Mocha. And it's going to take a second to read from the timeline. And let's see what I've done. So, I've come in here and I've rotoscoped just the inside of her eyes. And you can see that there's places where I couldn't track at all. Those places are actually where she closed her eyes. Now, I'm also going to show you how to get around that so that you can keep tracking data. Because if you look here, you can see that I still have tracking data. How did I get around that? I'll show you when we do our other shot. All right. So we, I rotoscoped her eyes. And once I had my, mo, uh, my mocha roto shape, let's save this and close it. I duplicated my layer, all right? And inside of this, let's just go ahead and turn all of my effects off and walk through it. So inside of here, what I did is I turned some levels on and I brought the whites very bright. So we brought the whites very bright and we lightened her eyes so that we can start to adjust the color of her eyes. Now this does not look natural at all, but that's okay, we're gonna knock it back down. The second thing I did is I added this effect called shadow highlight. And what that does is because I've taken her eyes and I've lightened them and darkened them, I wanted to add a little bit of a highlight and a little bit of a beveled shadow. This just makes it look a little bit more natural because your eyes actually have a lot of shadow in them. A lot of times people think of eyes as pure white. And, you know, I'm a painter. Um, actually, my, my degree is in fine art, which is always very funny to people. But um, when you paint people, eyes are never white, okay? Like, we, we just think of eyes as these football shapes um, that are white and then the, whatever solid color your iris is. And, of course, they're made up of, you know, millions of colors, and it's all very interesting looking. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and use a color correction to change this. So we used a three-way color grade. And what we can do is we can start to adjust 
the different colors in her eye so that we get a little bit of a subtle blue change. So in the overall gamma, I changed to a bright blue, and then we can also adjust down here if we need to. But the bright blue tended to do what I needed. Now, here's the other thing about this. Um, it's a little bit bright, okay? It doesn't look natural. So what I did is I made a royal blue solid and I just put the same mocha effect on top um, with my mat and I used it as a multiply layer right here over the top. And what that does is that knocks everything back down into something that's a little bit more realistic while still keeping some of the hues of the eye, okay? So we, we wanna make sure that we do this in a, in a several step process. It's not a one click effect, okay? Now, if you have a lot of shots that you're doing, what you may want to do is just make yourself a color corrector preset. Um, and then like, and I'm talking about for shots that are middle to distant, you know, um, make yourself a color correction and just slap it over the top. Um, you can do that. You can make yourself kind of a preset or you could do like a, an S effect and make a tint and um, a couple of color adjustments in the S effect and then apply that over the top. If you're doing a whole bunch of sister shots, um, I think we just interviewed a company that did 500 of these shots. So you might wanna build something that's a little more one click. Um, for me, because this was such a hero shot, I did something that was a little bit more complex. Hero shots always are a little bit more complex, but for most of the shots, you could probably get away with just doing a color correction and your mocha shade. So let's talk a little bit about some of the shots that I picked to mess with. Um, I looked at this one. I thought it was interesting. We've got a couple of really um, lovely images to work with and play with. Um, we've got some shots where, you know, we've got somebody, you know, in a breather that I kind of wanted to play with. But I think what I'm going to do is we're going to focus on one. Let's call her uh, uh, Benny Jesseret Witch. OK, and um, let's call her. Um, oh, my gosh, I'm spacing on her name. Um, who was a uh, Leto's? wife um and uh i'm spacing uh i need to turn in my nerd card anyway the original uh the original original uh benny jesser which who was the uh the mother of the quasitz haderach or however you say that um and we're going to uh to take this shot that looks kind of like her and we're going to make her eyes blue because of course she goes native um so to speak on arrakis um and if you haven't seen the movie you should definitely watch it all right, so let's go ahead and pick Mocha Pro. We're gonna take Mocha Pro and we're gonna drag and drop it right onto our timeline. Of course, for those of y'all that know the story, uh, she will eventually have very blue eyes um, and I will leave the spoilers as to why that is um, for another time. All right, Lady Jessica, thank you so much. Yes, I, Jessica, Lady Jessica. All right, there we go. We're gonna launch Mocha and we're gonna make Lady Jessica's eyes blue. So like I said, uh, with Dune, you know, I am a old school nerd. I've even watched the old movies when I was a kid. Um, but the book I read when I was about 12, and as you know, there's several, several books and they are all, <laughs> they eventually totally jumped the shark. So if you haven't read them, I highly recommend it. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to do a quick little track. Um, and I'm going to track this little, um, object that she's using. I think this is supposed to be a Ouija board um, controller uh, or a, what do you call the, I'm, it's going to be a day of me forgetting words, but this is a, this is a piece for a Ouija board that you use uh, when you're, when you're taking the Ouija board and uh, going over the letters. Um, like I said, this is not an original Dune shot. This is just stuff that you use when you're, um, you know, when we're looking on Pexels for free footage and this just looked close enough to me. All right. So I'm going to track this top section really quick. Um, and we're going to do this so that I can have a, uh, let's call this O-I-G-I. -I. Um, we'll call this Ouija um, track. All right. And what we're going to do is we're going to track this piece really quick um, so that we can use this um, to drive a holdout mat. So let's go ahead and hit track forwards. So when you're tracking um, these sorts of complex shots, the first thing you want to do is you want to isolate that holdout mat. Um, and you know, you, you have to think about shots and think about how we're going to work on them. So what we usually do is we say, all right, what are the major things that I need to look out for in this shot? In this shot, the major things I need to be concerned about are the occlusions of her fingers and the Ouija board over the top. All right. And as long as I can get those isolated, I'll be able to make sure that I can get a good track. 
All right, we also want to have a good roto mask on these because as her eyes are gonna change color, we're gonna need to isolate this back over the top. Now, the good news is we really only need to worry about nicely rotoscoping just the very ends of her fingers and the top of the board because she doesn't go up or down with it. So make sure that when you are, um, make sure that when you're rotoscoping, you don't rotoscope more than you need. If you rotoscope way too much more than you need, you're gonna just leave time on the table, so to speak, you're going to end up taking too much time to do your work. All right. So what we're doing is we're holding this out and this is nice and planar too. So of course, Mocha is going to latch onto it. Notice how I didn't change any settings. I left it right on translation, scale, rotation, and shear. Um, and I just used large motion. Yes, we could have tracked this with perspective and that could have given us more accurate data. But usually when I'm doing rotoscoping, I tend to leave perspective off. Um, it's not vital to do that, but it's just a force of habit because a lot of times when you are rotoscoping something, the object will bend in space and perspective, okay? And that bending in Z space can end up giving you kind of a hard time when you're tracking. All right, so how many of y'all have had a, a track where the shape just folded in on itself and points shot off into space? Um, that usually happens when you're tracking perspective and something is tilting away from the camera and back into camera, all right? Um, or when something is coming forward in the camera and it breaks the plane, so to speak. So perspective probably could have given me some more detailed tracking data for this um, Ouija board controller, but it's gonna be quick roto anyway, just because I know that the data is gonna be pretty accurate. Now, I do see that we're starting to come off the corner a little bit, and I'm gonna watch that because if it grabs onto any texture, it shouldn't. I'm gonna stop the track and then keep tracking. Did any of y'all have any tracking questions while I'm doing this? If you wanted to um, have a mesh generated for 3D comp comp comping for this, would power mesh work? Um, to an extent, it depends on what you're doing. So you can use an Alembic uh, export from our power mesh export to do a 3D comp. Um, you can even take that mesh and push it forwards and backwards in Z, Z space because what you're going to get is a flat mesh first. And then you can take that mesh and you can manipulate it forwards or backwards in Z space and start to, you know, put lights on it and that sort of thing if you need to change some lighting and have it move along with the track. Um, but the Alembic export for power mesh is going to be the way you do that. That's a pretty good question. Um, that works in a couple of different pieces of software. It works in Nuke, it works in Maya, and it should work in things like 3D Studio and um, Cinema 4D. So, but you need to make sure that when you're using an Alembic, you export it to something that supports Alembic. And I think it also works in Fusion as well. So um, yeah, it does because Fusion supports 3D models. So there's um, many ways that you can do that, but it is not going to be a, uh, when you import it, it will not be wrapped in a 3D space because you tracked in 2D and you will have to change that data to make it more 3D. Does that make sense? Um, Yes. So uh, ValArts is saying, I tend to want a track shot and then have the geo for future processing. Um, so the geo, like I said, is going to be a, a plane. And if you want to make it into a more dimensional geo, you will have to push and pull points once you export and import that Alembic into whatever your host software is. All right. And we do have a couple of breakdowns for how to use the Alembic um, in our documentation. And I highly recommend you, that you read those. We probably need to try to do a real I think we have one tutorial on it, but we probably need to try to dive into more Olympic tutorials. And that's a good reminder to do that. Okay, you'd really like to see that. We're not gonna do that this office hours um, because this shot is gonna take me the whole time, but that would be something to do for next office hours or the one after that. And I'll, I'll plan on doing that. Um, can you give me an example of the kind of work that you're doing so that I can plan a shot that's similar? And I'll wait for that in the answer. Um, all right. So while this is tracking, um, it's doing a pretty good job of sticking on, which is really nice. Um, and obviously this is going to take some time to track because it's kind of a long shot. Maybe what I'll do is, uh, let's, let's lessen this shot. We'll just, we'll do there and back. That's frame. Let's do frame 350. I'm going to save this and close it. And in the name of speed, I'm going to make this shot a little bit shorter so that we don't have to wait forever to finish it. All right, so let's go to layer and let's um, go to trim comp to, sorry, composition, trim comp to work area. There we go. All right, so now that's shorter. 
All right, so now when we lo load Mocha back up, let's see. All right, when we load Mocha back up, that will be tracked. Yeah, okay, perfect. All right, I don't wanna take too long on a shot because I wanna get the point across without taking forever. Obviously, this is a super long shot. All right, so we're gonna talk, call this Ouija track. We're gonna take our gear and turn it off because the gear means we're tracking something in Mocha. And then we're gonna take the eye and turn that off as well. And so now I'm gonna draw a, um, a sort of wider shape around this really quick because we're gonna try to do the tracking first. So let's do our big wide shape right around her hand and the Ouija thing together. And we're gonna call this Ouija, O-U-I-G-I, -I, holdout. I think that's how you spell Ouija. Um, and we're gonna link this to Ouija track. And so now I should have a holdout for the whole thing. And let's just do that thing where we use the favorite activate quick stabilize mode. Let's pin it in the middle of the screen. And yes, I do believe that stays inside the whole time where it crosses the eyes. Perfect. All right, I do see, however, as I scrub through, I see a problem area. I'm gonna use my Uber key and I'm gonna actually pull this out just a little bit more from this edge right here because I see a shadow moving across her head. And if I see it, Mocha is gonna see it. So if you look, it's real subtle, but it's right here, okay? And if I let that shadow get in the way of my track, I'm gonna have a problem while I try to track her eyes, okay? So let's get started on tracking her eyes. Okay, um, if y'all need to email me a shot or something because you want me to look at a problem that you're having, email me at maryp, M-A-R-Y-P, at boriseffects.com. And that's gonna be the best way to get a hold of me. And I'm happy to look at whatever you send me and put it in the next several office hours, depending on when I can fit it in, all right? All right, now let's move on to tracking. All right, I'm gonna hide that as well. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to track for her eyes. Now, the nice thing about eyes is they tend to be on the same plane, right, as the, um, as the forehead. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my X line and I'm gonna draw a shape right here around her forehead. And I'm gonna draw it over on the left side and the right side, okay? And it doesn't matter that, um, that we're starting at the beginning on this because honestly, in most of these shots, her head is as close to the camera as it's gonna be most parallel to the camera and least blurry. So any part of this timeline is a good place to start tracking. And we're, we are going to use perspective for this track because she's not turning her head away and turning it back, okay? But we want it to be as accurate as possible. And now we're gonna go ahead and hit track forward. I'm gonna leave it on 20% of pixels um, for minimum, minimum pixels. Minimum percent of pixels used means the accuracy of the track. And what it means is once Mocha has found 20% um, of those pixels, it will move on and say that that frame is good. Now I see that this is not giving me a very good track. So we're gonna go all the way back and we're gonna actually try tracking this without perspective and seeing if that gives us a better track. Excuse me. It would help if I put it behind the Ouija board. Let's call this forehead track. Let's drag this underneath. And that's a pretty good example of why you need to make sure your layer order is, uh, is correct. So if you look, let me turn my mat on here. Um, if you look, let's turn this mat on. You can see that my Ouija holdout is now gonna cut out of this shape when I'm tracking. And before I was telling it to look at all of them because I had left it at the top of the, um, the tracking pile while I was tracking because I just was talking and forgot what I was doing. We always wanna make sure that our holdouts are in the layers above that's normal inside of Mocha. All right, moving forward. That's better. Okay, so if you encounter troubles with your track, the first thing to do is start troubleshooting, all right? So in this troubleshooting was checking and checking our layer order. We can also do things like turn off perspective. We can do things like move to translation only. We can start using things like manual track or adjust to get around them. So there's all sorts of ways to get around a track that is not behaving. 
All right, and I still feel like this is not behaving. If you look, I'm. let's just scroll backwards. Okay, and let's turn our mat off. <clears throat> Excuse me. Turn our mat off. And let's look at our surface tool on our forehead track. If you look at our surface tool, let's go to set our surface tool. We're having a rendering issue here. Set my surface tool. Oh, you're not going to show it, are you? Okay, let's save Mocha really quick and close it because it's not behaving. I don't know why, but... But when all else fails, restart. All right, so let's launch Mocha again. And I bet I'll see my Surface Tool. We had like a little rendering blip there. There we go. So if we scroll, you can see that does not look right. Okay, so let's start troubleshooting this track. Let's turn translation scale and rotation only on and hit track forwards. Um, so we have a question here, which is how can you turn a track off for one section of the shot and then enable it in another? Okay. What I tend to do is animate the shape off screen for that um, and, or use manual track. So if you have a total occlusion, the best way to handle that is to make a keyframe um, in manual track on the last good tracking frame that you have and then jump ahead to the last good tracking frame that you have. Um, you know, and there's a gap there, right? And then what you can do is you can animate into it from either side, all right? And that is a really good way to get around a total occlusion. Um, with rotoscoping, I tend to just move the shape off the screen. But for tracking, I tend to use manual track. I hope that makes sense. Um, manual track is where you can suddenly hand animate the track. And the nice thing about setting a keyframe before and after Okay, is that once you've done that, you can track into the problem areas and then keep only what is good tracking data from there. And um, and I can show you that. Let's see if she blinks in the shot. If she blinks in the shot, I'll show you also how to get around it that way or how to track around it. So this is looking a lot better as far as how our track is looking. I'm going to stop this, though, and I'm going to move this, sh this shape in a little bit because her hair is kind of touching the area that I'm tracking and her hair will be another occlusion that I'd have to worry about. So you can always stop and work around occlusions. So the first thing you do when something's occluding is you animate your shape around it. Okay. The second thing you do with some, when something is occluding is you will need to start thinking about either using adjust track or manual track to fix it. If you track through something and it's a little wonky, um, that's when adjust track comes in handy. And if there's a total occlusion, that's where manual track comes into play. So there's many, many ways to get around them. They tend to involve hand animation, getting around something that's completely occluded. I hope that makes sense. All right. And let's let this get finished here. It's going to take a second. All right. So why am I tracking her forehead? instead of tracking um, her eyes, okay? If you look, her eyes are getting totally occluded. So this is another way to get around occlusions. It's what we call offset tracking in other trackers, but we're not offset tracking. We're just tracking something that moves similarly, okay? Um, we're, we didn't move the track over, you know, and then come back, which is what offset tracking would be, where you're tracking an object, then you move it to another object that's moving similarly and come back. Um, that is one way, but what we're doing instead is we're just offset tracking through the whole shot. And the reason we're doing that is because we know that we're rotoscoping this and we know that we don't need super, super, super accurate um, tracks. We just need something that we can animate and animate into a space that makes sense. All right, another tracking question. I've got some shots where I have to add a scar to the forehead of a person, but there's, a, there's huge light changes due to the sirens of a police car. Oh boy. All right, so those are one of, <laughs> you have to think about lights from a police car as total occlusions, okay? Um, what you can do is when you're tracking something like that, you can track the object until the light interference reaches the object, and then you can try one of two things. You can either try manually tracking by hand animating the track through that section, 
or you can see if tracking translation only will get you through those couple of frames where it's a real problem and then keep tracking from there. Um, it'll be a real mix of hand animation and, um, and tracking data. So the tracking data will assist you, but it will not make it to where there's not hand animation that has to be necessary for something where you have a total shadow occlusion or total light occlusion that totally throws the track off. Normally we can track through shadows um, and there will be some drift, but you know, normally we can just track through shadows if they're light enough. If the object is starkly changing um, to where it doesn't even look like the previous pixels anymore, um, Mocha's not gonna be able to find it again just because the pixels aren't there to find. So I hope that makes sense. Um, offset, can I talk a little bit more about offset tracking? Yes, okay. Um, for example, if somebody is, um, if you're rotoscoping somebody that's uh, closing their eye, like they're blinking, okay? Um, what I would start with is I would start tracking the inside of the eye. Okay. And then as they blink, you can take that shape and just move it up to the eyebrow for the blink. Once the blink is complete, move it back down and keep tracking. All right. And then, so what you'll have to do is between those spaces, you'll have to hand animate the blink, but the track will be accurate through the blink. Does that make sense for offset tracking? I'll show you, I'll actually show you in the um, other shot really quick. Um, I'll jump over, I'll jump back to that first shot and talk about this for a second since y'all are asking questions about it. Um, and then I'll jump back to this shot just to, um, to make sense. So, cause this is a little bit more complex as far as um, occlusions go. All right, uh, we have another question, which is, I was at a Boris FX talk where they had a similar and pre and had pre -proce processed the footage with an edge detect or something similar. Okay, yeah, you can do something like that. Um, so you can take the equivalent of a high pass filter and a frequency separation, and you can apply it to your shot and see if you can track through that if the lighting changes are extreme. But do understand that you will still get limited results for that. Um, that's really only a pre-processing that you can do um, if there's not, if the pre-processing filter is not reading the lighting um, as an edge. And if you have harsh lighting, your pre-processing will also read that lighting as an edge. So Yes, there's certainly some tricks you could try to get around harsh lighting, but understand that even those tricks are subject to the data that you have. So they can make it easier, but anytime you start pre-processing footage, um, you're gonna start degrading the kind of information that you can get into Mocha because Mocha reads the pixel data and it tends to prefer the pixel data that's been unaltered. Um, that being said, you can get away with a lot um, if there's a nice texture in your pre-processed file. So just think texture and think occlusions, okay, when you're trying to track with Mocha. Um, somebody says they'd really like to see more mega plates and nuke in upcoming office hours. Thank you. Please email me that and um, I will put something together. So, and if you want to see more things in office hours, um, you can always email me at maryp at borisfx.com. And it's M-A-R-Y-P at borisfx.com. And what I will do is I will take a look at what you're working on and I will try to build something similar. Or if you have permission to show your shot, um, I can even use your shot directly. So that's very helpful for, for upcoming office hours. As long as I know what you guys are looking for, um, we can work on office hours based on those. Okay, so since you guys were asking about uh, partial occlusions, I'm gonna save this really quick and I'm gonna just show the other eye. Let's save this. How are we doing on time? Doing great on time. All right, let's save. Let's jump back to our original shot, which is, I wanna say it was this one. It was, let's launch Mocha. All right, here we are. And now that we've launched Mocha, let's show you how to get past this eye occlusion. So I'm gonna turn these off, gear, 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 gear. Let's move over here and let's see, let's find a blink. Perfect. I thought I found one. Yeah, I did. Okay. So if we're trying to track her eye, let's come over here, track this eye. Here we are. 
Let's select the middle part and relax it. And now let's hit track four. Well, let's align the edge a little bit better than that. There we are. All right, now let's hit track forwards. And watch, as she blinks, this is not going to look good. And I'll turn the surface tool on so you can see too. All right. So that's a failure of the track, right? All right, so we don't like that. That's not what we want. So let's find the last good frame of her eye before it starts to close. Take this shape. Let's move it up to her eyebrow. Track forwards. Now let's wait till we're past that occlusion. All right, so her eyes are back where they should be. And I see on this frame, it's fully open. So I'm going to move the shape back down and keep tracking. All right, so now when I want to rotoscope this, I come back and I actually delete those keyframes. So now I just have the one keyframe. And there's my eye tracked. All right, and the eye track is accurate, but now I have to change the roto shape. So what I'd want to do is hand animate the roto shape past the problem area, just like this. And now we've got something that looks a little bit better. I'm not gonna do a, a perfect roto here because I have the other shot I'm working on, but I wanna show you how this looks. So just like that. And again, raise that up, adjust, all right? So blink, blink. Does that make sense? Um, I actually wouldn't remove this off the screen because when you close your eyes, um, so somebody's asking, you would just move this shape off the screen. Um, I would not necessarily move this shape off the screen. I would just animate it shut because if you look at eyes, and I'll zoom in here, you can still see her eye when she blinks. It's still there. So I would just make a more accurate roto shape just like this. All right. The reason for that is if you take it totally off, it might look like it pops on and off. OK, but eyes never really, really close the way you think they do. So if you want to copy a shape or duplicate a shape, um, you can duplicate the layer by hitting layer duplicate. And now you have duplicated shape. Um, so that's pretty easy, but you can't just like copy and paste a shape back in. So um, so if you want to do that, uh, you really need to either break it up into layers where you, um, let's say you really need two separate layers. Then what you would do is you duplicate your shape and you take your layer and you would trim it. So what we could do is we could trim this shape where the out point is here. Okay. And now this shape, our end point is there. Okay. So it's two different, two different layers, you see. But when combined, you can't tell that it's two different layers. So there's many, many, many ways to skin this cat. So it just depends on what you need to do. Um, so um, instead of reorganizing the eye shape every time it opens and closes, can you copy and paste the shape? No, but here's what I can do. Um, let's delete that, show you this. Let's come back here and make this full frame. Um, instead of deleting it, Let's just go here. Instead of deleting it, instead of copying and pasting it, I can take my shape. So here's my original shape. Here's where it's still good. Make a keyframe. Blink. Make a new keyframe. All right, and moving on. All right, so now I can just animate here and it'll go back to that space. So that's a really good question. All right, so now it opens back up. And that's the same shape. So you can always think about making your keyframes for your accurate sections before you start worrying about tricky areas. So I hope that helps you going forward um, with partial occlusions and, um, and offset tracking. And I'm going to go back to the original shot and dive back into what we were doing. All right, um, let's uh, delete that shape and save. Save and close. All right, so back into our trickier shot. Let's go back to project and let's go back to good old Jessica here. 
Okay. I'm glad y'all like that tip. That's, um, so you just, just be smart about keyframes and you'll save yourself time. Okay. Moving right along. Let's launch this back open and start. All right. So now I've got Lady Jessica. We want her eyes. So we got our forehead track done and we have our holdout tracks done. So let's hide everything. So now that I've done all my pre-tracking, I can actually get to my work. All right. And I know that takes a long time, but it, it takes a long time because now I can do the work easier. So let's come in here and let's draw a nice little roto shape using the X spline on the inside of her eye, making sure that I stay out of her water lines, which for those of you that don't do makeup, your water line is the very inside of your eye, right above your eyelashes. I'm sure I made a great face making, uh, doing that, but here, we, you know, we're very glamorous here. Um, okay. So I'm making a corner here for this, uh, edge of her eye. I'm coming in for her tear duct so that I don't grab too much of the pink in her eye. All right. And we're making these, the edges soft and curved at the top and the bottom, just like this. All right. So nice and beautimus. Okay. So we're going to call this right eye, even though, yes, I know it's really her left eye, but it's the right eye for me. All right. And we're going to link this to our forehead track. And so now if I've done everything correctly, I will only have a little bit of rotoscoping to do. So let's use our activate quick stabilize mode and let's check out this eye. So you can see it's not perfect. All right. So now what we have to do is we have to animate. So let's animate this into place. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to the very end of the shot and we're going to animate this into a, a more likely place. All right. So here's her eye. All right. Now, already that's starting to look better. So let's look for areas where it's the most different. And we're just going to start tilting this into place. And you can see it starts to look a lot nicer really quickly. All right. Same thing here. We're going to just adjust it just like this. So much of rotoscope is hand animation. But what we want to do is we want to save ourselves time on that animation. That's why we do the tracks. So let me turn my tracking tool off here. There we are. And let's move this here. So you can see she's blinking again, right? So I want to make sure that I have a good keyframe for her blink before I start animating that. So let's hit a keyframe. And here's like a last good frame before she blinks. And you can see I'm judging that based on where her eyelashes are. If you look, I'm being sneaky. I'm judging that based on where her eyelashes are. And now her eyelashes are back open. And here they're closed. And here it's open. All right. So now we can start adjusting the blink. Just like this. rotoscoping, so much rotoscoping. It's all rotoscoping all the time. All right, here we go. And let's adjust this again. The thing about blinks is blinks, blinks don't always behave. Um, blinks are not uniform. Blinks are not just like close and open. They have a fall off to the animation. So you really got to see what the eye is doing. Usually you have a couple of frames that are really quick at the beginning a wider close and then an open as far as animation keyframes go. So you see how this stays down for a little while. Her blink is slow. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep this roto shape closed a little bit longer and make it a little bit more narrow. And I'm using the transform tool to do that as well, just like this. And because we're going to be using some feathering, you won't even hardly see um, the closed bit, but it's nice and subtle. We could just move it off off frame, but I don't want to. Um, and the reason I don't want to is because I want to keep that subtlety in there. So now I can see part of her iris again. And it gets really fuzzy when folks are blinking because their eye, their eyelashes get in the way. All right, here we are. I'm going to raise this up a little bit more, just like that. All right. And in that time frame, her eye 
changes location again because she's blinking again. All right. Now, moving right along, here we are. I'm probably going to just ignore what's happening here in the middle because it's not important. All right, so let's start to change this animation as well, just like this. And you can see she's wobbling her eye a little bit, which means we're going to have to do a little bit more hand animation. There we go. And I'm going to have to adjust this here as well. Perfect. All right, so let's adjust here. We're just rotoscoping. We're just rotoscoping. Um, rotoscoping is just one of those things that takes time. So it just takes time to do a lot of keyframes. This would go a little bit faster if I was using a Wacom tablet, but I'm not because I'm running a live stream at the same time and I want to have control of my mouse. So um, sorry, but either way, rotoscoping is just one of those things that takes time and I'm halfway decent at rotoscoping quickly anyway, even with a mouse, um, even though it doesn't seem that way. Uh, let's go ahead and move on. Here we are. All right, we're almost done. And there we are. I'm just going to do one eye um, today because I think I don't want to run out of time and I don't want folks to get bored with watching me rotoscope. All right, let's correct this again just a little bit more over time. There we are. All right, so we have this beautiful, beautiful eye. Let's, let's do her, her little blink that she's got. Just like this. It looks like she's fluttering her eyes. All right, here we are. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take this roto shape and we're going to start color correcting her eyes. Okay, so let's hit save and let's hit close. There we are. Save and close. Okay, perfect. All right, now let's go ahead and duplicate this. And uh, let's go ahead and go into matte and let's go to visible layers. I can see that my right eye is visible. So let's hit OK and hit apply matte. And so now you'll see I have her iris isolated. Okay. Now, not iris, um, her uh, iris and uh, sclera. Um, okay, and so now we're going to do a little bit of a feather on her eye. That might be too much. Let's do like four, uh, six. All right, let's do a nice soft feather on her eye and let's do a color correction. So let's go to color correct. Let's do a BCC color correction right on here. And let's, let's do three-way color correction. Three-way, three-way. Here we are. Wonderful. Let's come over here on our gamma and just make everything as blue as possible. Okay, I like that, but I don't like the um, the values. So let's see about pulling the blacks down and pulling some of the contrast up. All right. So now let's see what that looks like if we zoom out. Fit. All right, so now we have kind of a nice little little eye there. Um, and you can see that we've got her other eye over here the same way. So here's our three by color corrector. And now we have a problem. We've got her eye, but we've got her Ouija board that's in the way. All right, and that's not ideal. So what we can do is we can try to do something about that. Um, let's come over to our layer and let's duplicate it and drag it above. We're going to call this right eye, really important to name your layers, and we're going to call this Ouija board um, controller. 
Okay. And then matte. Okay. So now let's launch Mocha again on this layer. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a really quick roto on this little Ouija board. And I'll show you something kind of neat about it. Let's hit start. And let's turn this off and then let's make a new shape. Now I can use the magnetic spline tool if I want. Um, I don't necessarily want to do that right now because I just don't want to have a lot of points to correct. But let's make a nice, nice little roto shape right around this Ouija board. Again, I'm really only caring about the edges where it crosses the eye. Okay, and let's soften that. And now let's use the add to X-Blind tool, add to X-Blind. Let's draw a little shape here. And let's take these points and let's adjust them into the right place. So it just is easier to use a primitive than it is to try to do everything by hand. There we go. These save you time. But now if you look, my mat has a hole in it based on that cutout. Okay. So we'll call this Ouija mat. And we're going to link this to our Ouija holdout. And so now if we've done everything, excuse me, we're going to link our track to Ouija track, not mat. Ouija track. All right. So now the timeline has turned blue and shows me that I have tracking data. So now what I can do is I can just make sure that this stays accurate throughout my shot. All right, zooming in. I can see that I need to make some adjustments. Let's take this and adjust it. Just like this. All right, same thing for this edge. We're going to take these points and pull them out. So take these points and bring them to this edge here. All right, now let's look for where they start to fall off. All right, so they need to be adjusted here. We really need to only worry about it where it crosses the eyes. So it needs to be adjusted here. And here as well. All right, so now if I save this and close it, I can even do things like add motion blur. Let's uh, let's just add motion blur to this. Add motion blur and let's save and close. Now, if I go into my mat and I go apply mat, you'll see my Ouija board is over the top. And even if I come here over the eyeball area, I've got my nice holdout. Now it's probably too crisp. So let's do a nice feathered edge so that it hides all our sins. And that's a pretty easy way to do this shot. So. We can also add glows. We could do things like start to add some um, effects onto this. So um, if I wanted to do something like make a lightning effect on her eyes, uh, what I would do is I would take Mocha and let's talk a little bit about a just track. Okay, so let's launch Mocha. And if I wanted to add something to the center of her eye, like for instance, an S zap or something, um, let's go to her eye. So here's our right eye. And if I turn my surface tool on, you can tell that we're going to have some problems trying to get something to fit with her eye. Cause look at my track. Um, it's kind of staying where it's supposed to, but it's also kind of wobbling all over the place and going to the corner of her eye. Well, we don't like that. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to duplicate this layer and we're going to call this right effect. Okay. And now with right effect, I'm going to, use my activate quick stabilize mode so you can see that is just not staying in the center of her eye and I would like it to stay in the center of her eye. Okay. That's a problem. So let's turn this off. Let's move our surface tool to the center of her eye. And now let's go to our adjust track over an adjust track. I'm going to use translation only and set my point right here in the middle. Okay. And we're going to say, set this as a reference frame now that I've selected my point. And now we're going to hand animate this. So I'm going to go to the end of my shot. And I'm going to adjust this. Excuse me. We're going to adjust this. Ooh, we're having a bug. It's a problem. Interesting. Well, we can work around a bug, 
But right now, we're going to move this to the center of her eye. Interesting. All right. Well, now that we've found a bug, uh, let's reset this. Let's go to... Hmm. Let's actually set the points. Let's do a perspective one because I know those work. Um, and let's go set points and let's move the surface tool down here and let's actually move my points where I can find them again. So I'll do here and here and here and here. All right. And now let's select one of my points. I don't know what that bug is about. We're, we're not going to worry about it. We're going to say set reference frame. And now let's start to set our reference frames. Let's move our points. Excuse me. Let's turn all of these off. And let's move our points. Yeah, I know you don't like it. Excuse me. Let's move our points in pieces. Are you just going to be like that today? Apparently we are. Interesting. Yeah, we're just going to have a bug today with our adjust track, and I don't know why, but I'm not going to worry too much about it. We'll figure out why that is with the dev team later. All right. Well, I'll show you one more way to skin a cat then, if it's going to be that way. Let's delete this layer. If you ever encounter something like this where you're having perspective problems, let's go to our right eye. Let's go to our parameters. Let's go to track. Let's go to um, export tracker. We can apply the track. Let's go to save and close. All right. And now let's come over here and let's go to a layer new null object. All right, and we're going to take our null object. I don't know why that's working that way, but we're going to take our null object. We're going to put it right here. Um, and now we're going to take our track. Um, we're going to go to tracking data. We're going to say create track data. I want to create the track data from the right eye. Hit OK. We're going to do a transform, and we're going to apply it to our null. And we're going to hit apply export. And so now what we'll end up with is this null that moves like our track moves, OK? But our null is not 100% accurate based on that track, right? Based on the problem with our track. So let's go to our transform and let's do an anchor point animation. And I'm going to move our anchor point. What we can do is we can adjust the anchor point to be where it's supposed to be. So we can always just come in here. And because we've animated it, we can adjust our anchor point along with our tracking data, just like that. And so what we'll do is we'll just correct it over time in places until it lines up correctly. So it's kind of a manual address track is what we're doing. We're doing an offset just like that. So you end up with something that looks more like this. Let's come in here and Let's turn that off. There we go. Here we are. Let's hit play. Let's put this in draft mode so that it'll play. All right, play. And take a look at our null. So here's our null moving more like how it's supposed to move. And then we could link any, any effects that we wanted to onto that. So folks, that is office hours today. Office hours was useful because we were able to show you a lot of stuff, but we were also apparently able to find a bug that I need to talk to the dev team about. Yay. Um, if you have any questions about what we're doing, um, go ahead and email me at maryp at forestfx.com and I'm happy to answer them. We do these once a week. If you liked what you saw, I would love for you to like and subscribe. Uh, we'll be doing these every week, Tuesdays at one o'clock. And these are about an hour long. And what I do is I sit and answer your questions and we go through all of our effects. So today was how to do dune eyes. It's a bunch of roto, you know, and a little bit of color correction. And the color correction is really nice and fun. You know, it's really easy to do. Uh, but you can also do things like start to add more effects like beveling and all sorts of problems. Um, so uh, one of the comments here is uh, if you had that situation, you'd create another null and offset it and, and link it and to do an, a correction, you can also do that. There's many ways, many, many ways to skin this cat. 
So um, yes, that is another workflow you could use. Um, but anyway, if you guys have any questions, uh, Mary P at BorisFix.com. Thanks for tuning in. And I hope you learned a lot. And if you have any feedback, let us know. Thanks so much and have a great day.